Okay, this video is called How to Prevent Blood Clotting. And I made two earlier videos that might be useful to you. First one was called Hypercoagulability, you know, rarity and uh, something else. That one would be useful to you if you want to learn more about things that cause blood clotting in general. <clears throat> I also made a video called Amyloidogenic Clotting, where I talked about the work of Douglas Kell and Etheresia Pretorius. Um, that's a fancy type of clotting related to leaky gut as well as iron overload. Okay, now we're just going to talk about ways to prevent clotting. And the reason this is super relevant is blood clots are the main reason that people die. You know, in the movies, you see people bleeding, okay? But in real life, that almost never happens. In real life, you, you clot an artery in the heart, you get a heart attack. You clot an artery in the brain, you get a stroke. You clot off arteries throughout the body and bad things happen. You know, you... Uh, you clot off the artery in the eye, you go blind. You clot off the artery to the hearing apparatus of the brain and the ear, you go deaf. Um, you clot off arteries in little locations that you might not even notice all at once, and you develop problems like atrial fibrillation with the heart, like congestive failure, congestive heart failure with the heart. Um, you make a tissue ischemic by decreasing its blood supply because of atherosclerosis, for example, and that ischemia, ischemia means lack of oxygen delivery, causes cancer to develop. For example, that's called the Warburg effect. Otto Warburg was a German biochemist, won the Nobel Prize in 1931 for showing human tissue cultures would turn cancerous when deprived of oxygen by 35% or more. Okay, so that's also called the metabolic theory of cancer. And I can tell you, I wrote an entire book about the biochemistry of cancer. There's a ton more more data to support the metabolic theory of cancer than the somatic mutation theory, which is what conventional medicine goes by. I actually think the somatic mutation theory has been to a large extent disproven, for example, by the General Atlas Project. Okay, so anyways, getting back to this lecture here on how to prevent blood clotting. Um, conventional medicine is always going to talk about drug approaches, and drug approaches can be beneficial. But that's not what we're going to talk about here today. We're going to talk about non-drug ways to prevent blood from clotting abnormally. Okay, first one is being iron overloaded. Most people are iron overloaded. Everybody always thinks about anemia, and yeah, anemia does occur. Okay, but almost everybody in America, all the men over age, you know, 25, tend to be iron overloaded. And women tend to become overloaded when they're postmenopausal. They stop menstruating. That menstruation protects them. It's a therapeutic phlebotomy every month to lower their hematocrit, make their blood less thick, so they have less hypertension, okay, thus less atherosclerosis, thus less heart attacks and stroke. And I think that's the main reason why women live longer. The women who get hysterectomies at a young age have a lot more medical problems. Their blood becomes physiologically like a man's. Okay, so getting right back to how do you lower iron. You can donate blood. Um, that can be a little bit of a pain in the butt. I recommend donate the smallest possible amount uh, at a time. Get hydrated first. I didn't donate the small amount, but I wasn't well hydrated first. I kind of did it on a spur of the moment due to time convenience. And I felt a little lightheaded afterwards and had to lay down. I did not like that. So I don't do that anymore. And instead, I can tell you, there's a whole bunch of books on iron biochemistry that all recommend you donate blood. And also this guy right here, Dr. Sloop, he's this genius atherosclerosis researcher, the best one in the whole world. He routinely, you know, like every couple of months, uh, will donate blood to keep his hematocrit lower. I told him he should just become a vegan, and he's working on it. Okay, anyways, um, what I do is, like, let's say I have to go to get my total cholesterol check, my vitamin B12 check, my serum ferritin check, whatever it is. I will just have them pull off a bunch of small test tubes, like, you know, five test tubes and just discard it, okay? Uh, that way I gradually get my uh, serum ferritin down. You know, you, ideally you'd like it about 30 to 40. Mine had been high the first time I checked it a couple years ago because when I was young I thought iron was good for you. You know, like Popeye the Sailor Man, I used to eat all these high iron cereals like Raisin Bran with extra iron fortified added to it, which was stupid, but I didn't know any better when I was young. So anyways, my original iron was 240, and that was normal. Normal was something like three below 350 serum ferritin. But ideally... You want to get it below uh, 80, so 30 to 80 is a good thing. You don't want to be below 30 because you increase your risk of something called restless leg syndrome. Um, and that will help prevent ferrous redox cycling in the blood where it cycles back and forth between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus in generating hydroxyl radicals, which can cause amyloidogenic clotting. Not good. 
Okay, number two, you want to, and, and you'll, you'll catch that all in my lectures by Douglas Kell and Ethereza Pretorius. They're the ones that did the whole work on how LPS and LTA, the bacterial endotoxins, cause distortion of fibrinogen proteins. Really a, like a prion transformation from secondary protein structure of alpha helix to beta pleated sheet. You know, so instead of being like a cylinder, it becomes flat like a deck of cards. They stack up and they precipitate out a solution in the blood. And that's a clot. And they're hard to dissolve clots because they've got distorted fibrinogen structure. Because the body's always making small clots and dissolving them all the time. They have no symptomatic effect. It's when they get bigger and they're in bad locations, they start causing problems. And a lot of people have excessive clotting problems. For example, infections can cause excessive clotting. And that includes bacterial and viral. So that's important. Viral-related clotting can be a big deal and cause a person to die. Okay, So learning how to prevent clotting can help protect a person from uh, forming bad clots. Okay, um, avoid dietary sodium, uh, adding sodium to one's food, because that inhibits endothelial nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the vasodilator. Nitric oxide also prevents platelets uh, from aggregating, from clotting. So when you block nitric oxide, you're not only vasoconstricting, making the artery narrow, you're also causing the platelets to be more likely to aggregate, to stick together, to clot. Uh, the vasoconstriction also causes hypertension, which over time leads to um, damage to the arterial walls and thickening of the arterial walls and less oxygen delivery to the tissues and development of atherosclerosis. It's prothrombotic. It's not good. Okay, number three, eat more plants. Basically, all the good stuff is in the plants. Okay, in the plants, you get fiber, which protects you from leaky gut thus protecting you from leaky gut-related clotting. It also protects the blood-brain barrier, which protects your brain. It also has potassium and magnesium, which are both vasodilators. They're the good guys. So the good uh, positive ions, you know, cations, are potassium and magnesium. And then the evil bad one is sodium, okay? So potassium and magnesium, they're vasodilators. You need those to run your plasma membrane sodium potassium pumps, uh, and our ancestors probably ate about 25 to 1 potassium over sodium, whereas modern people in our crazy world of processed food um, are eating about you know 10 to 1 or more sodium than potassium. So we flipped the ratio, and that screws up our plasma membrane gradients, and that makes us more hypertensive and causes a whole bunch of other problems. But I'm just letting you know that's back to nature. And that's why I say, you know, you want to be healthy, live like Adam and Eve, but keep your indoor heating and plumbing. Okay, other things that are good about plants. They provide nitrate precursors, especially your greens, for example. Um, and this also is a little bit like why, you know, uh, Dr. Esselstyn was saying for his really high-risk patients, he recommends they sort of munch on greens all day long, which to me sounds like a cumbersome, you know, pain in the ass, but maybe it's useful. You know, Esselstyn is usually right. I think the guy's brilliant. I think he deserves a Nobel Prize for his work on preventing coronary artery disease. However... I still haven't seen a paper saying that that's really a good idea, or I haven't seen a paper showing that that really improves vasodilation throughout the day. Maybe it does. Certainly the rationale is pretty good, but you know I just don't know for certain. Um, and I did watch his lectures pretty carefully, a couple of them. Maybe in a newer lecture he's addressed that. Okay, nitrates are the also, like I said, the precursors to systemic nitric, nitric oxide. So when they come into your mouth as nitrates, NO3. The bacteria on the top, of the top of the tongue convert them to NO2, nitrites. Then in the stomach, the stomach acid converts them to uh, nitric oxide. Okay, so what else do you want to do to make sure that works? Don't use, you know, F- minus toothpaste or mouthwash because that wipes out the bacteria on the back of the tongue and you can't make the first step in this conversion and you lose this systemic vasodilator, okay? Don't be taking PPA, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors for your stomach and deplete your stomach acid because then you'll lose this second step in this production of systemic nitric oxide. So systemic means throughout the body, okay? It means like, like if you just talk about nitric oxide in the heart muscle, you're just talking about heart disease. But when you talk about systemic nitric oxide, you're talking about nitric oxide um, throughout the body. A local effect would be something like taking uh, one of those medications, you know, like Viagra to cause increased nitric oxide, you know, in the Johnson to, to help the Johnson work better. But, you know, smartest move is just, Fix yourself with a healthy diet, and you'll be more likely to keep the Johnson working. Okay, um, most common reason the Johnson stops working is you're plugging up the arteries down there with atherosclerosis.
Okay, uh, let's see. So we talked about the plants having potassium, having magnesium, having fiber, having nitrates. And they also got a lot more antioxidants. So eat plants for antioxidants, and that prevents oxidative stress. It helps protect you against the oxidative stress actions of excessive iron, iron overload, of F minus, and of other toxins, okay? And it helps protect your mitochondria as well, which are quite vulnerable to oxidative stress. That's actually the big battleground for oxidative stress. It occurs in other locations too, but the mitochondria is the key location where that's a major, major issue. Okay, um, sunshine. You want to get your sunshine because you have nitric oxide precursors in your subcutaneous tissues that are released into your blood to have a systemic vasodilator effect when you go out in the sun. That's why it feels good to walk out in the sun. Okay, number six, hydration. Hydration, raise, uh, dehydration sort of dehydrates the blood, makes it dried out a bit, and it makes the blood thicker. Thicker blood's a little more prone to clotting, a little more. So just be aware of that, okay? It's not. So, and then hydrate makes sure you're drinking good water, you're not osmotically overloaded. I made separate videos on that, but that's just one more thing. I'm basically talking about what can a person do when they fear that they're at risk for forming more clots. And this is a whole bunch of little steps. Each one might only have a real small beneficial effect for you as an individual, one or two percent. But let's say, what do I got? I think I got like about 24 things here. If each one had a, you know, two percent benefit, you're talking about a 48, basically about a 50 percent benefit. That's a lot. And it's probably more than that, actually. Okay, avoid dietary fat. Fat is for chumps. There's no such thing as good fats. I've made videos about that. I believe this whole good fats movement is just another, it's just another slogan to take advantage of low IQ chumps, okay? When you systematically go through it, you don't want to be having more sat fat. You don't want to be having more trans fat, of course, but even omega-3 fats, the so-called angelic omega-3 fats, increase your risk of prostate cancer. They're thought to increase your risk of metastatic cancer, increase your risk of obesity, increase your risk of insulin resistance. I think omega-3 supplementation is for chumps. And also, um, you're overloading them. You don't need that many, okay? You can still remember stuff from your childhood because you don't turn over your neurons that fast. All right, and so that's a whole other topic. I've made separate videos on it. We're not going to go into that anymore right at this moment. Um, omega-6 fats are super bad. That's I've talked about that in plenty of other lectures. So they're all bad. All the fats are bad. And then what's the good fat? The secret fat. The secret fat is fiber fat because the fiber that you eat, the dietary fiber in your colon, some of that gets converted into short-chain fatty acids. And that gives your body what it needs. And you only need a minuscule, tiny amount of the omega-6s and the omega-3s. Those are the only two essential fats. Okay, so you get those just by eating plant foods. And then whatever else you need, you get it from the fiber. So you can forget about looking for any more than that. Avoid unnecessary stress. Stress elevates acute phase reactant proteins from the liver, including fibrinogen, the blood clotting protein. It is prothrombotic. Okay, remember what the mechanism, the, the way to, the metaphor for remembering stress is being chased by a tiger in the dark. And the tiger scratches you, you might bleed. So stress makes you clot faster. Okay, it's prothrombotic. It also raises blood pressure and that has a toxic effect. It also is an immune suppressor. So it does all kinds of bad things. And guess what? Coffee and caffeine do the exact same, well, just about the exact same thing. And increase cortisol, increase catecholamines. So, you know, it's absolutely stupid to say, I'm stressed out, have a cup of coffee, okay? And the way you get yourself into a vicious cycle is if, let's say you're sleep deprived. Sleep deprivation is perceived by the body as stress, elevates the same hormones, cortisol and catecholamines. Catecholamines are noradrenaline and adrenaline. So basically, you're screwing up if you think drinking coffee is the answer. I mean, don't get me wrong, if you're sleep deprived and you need to drive home, you better maybe have a cup of coffee so you don't fall asleep in your car. Okay, but I'm just saying, on a regular general basis, the smart move is get adequate sleep, avoid caffeine, learn how to manage your stress. And I think good ways to manage stress is, you know, avoid negative, stupid people. A lot of people just can't help it. They're jerks. And, you know, that's just what they are. So just avoid them to the extent you can. Don't bicker about petty things that are of no significance. Don't watch, you know, the midstream fake uh, news, you know, that's all fake and just stresses you out and it's designed to do that, okay? Um, so focus on things that are positive and that uplift you. And, okay, I'll talk about that a little later, but you get the point. Avoid unnecessary stress. Okay, 
obtain adequate sleep. And the main thing that I've seen for sleep is go to bed earlier. Well, first of all, avoid caffeine, but go to bed earlier. That's the hard thing is getting to bed on time. Like if you're working a long day, it's hard to get to bed on time, you know. But try to get to bed earlier because we tend to wake up at the same time every day. I made entire separate videos about how to optimize sleep. Okay, um, it elevates the same hormones as stress. Okay, avoid caffeine. We just talked about that. Avoid calcium supplements, especially large amounts of calcium supplement. Calcium is a blood clotting uh, factor, and so if you take a big bolus of calcium, you can get this big elevation in your blood calcium, and that's thought to cause uh, increased risk of clotting, thrombosis. All right, and the women who were taking over 1,400 milligrams a day had 2.6 times increased cardiovascular mortality, which... You know, it's crazy. That's a big increase in cardiovascular mortality. So they think they're trying to do something to prevent osteoporosis. And what they're really doing is clotting off their arteries and, you know, killing themselves. Stupid. Okay, and if you're clotting off your coronaries, you're probably clotting off other parts of your body and making them less functional as well. Okay. So, um, yeah, and like a lot of people, you know, they just say stupid stuff, you know. I was talking to this one weightlifter guy, okay, and I was telling him, you know, he should eat more plant foods to get more blood flow to his spine, and he ignores me, and, you know, now he's got all these back problems, and he thinks he needs an MRI to go for surgery, and like what I told him is, well, look, genius, the most common cause of back pain and degenerative disc disease is lack of blood flow to the spine, so why don't you eat a diet that will improve blood flow to your spine, <laughs> and you'd be less likely to have all these problems, uh, you know, and then he'll watch some bodybuilder on the internet tell him to eat all this crap. And he believes that more than he believes me. Um, so, you know, I'm 60 years old. I still do squats. My back is strong, you know, and I don't have any problems with blood flow. All right, anyways, I got, I got a lot of you. I, I can remember when I was young, I knew guys in their late 30s, early 40s, doctors that were going on Viagra, okay? And that's all because they plugged up their arteries, okay? Okay, next thing, number 12, moderate exercise. Moderate exercise prevents stasis of blood flow. Um, it improves lymphatic flow, helps prevent risk of cancer and infections. You sleep better at night when you get a moderate amount of exercise. Now, I would be careful about excessive exercise. If you super overdo it, I mean, if you're in great physical shape and you've worked up to it, fine. Go ahead, run a marathon, do a triathlon, all that, that's fine. But if you're a regular person, don't rush too fast into heavy amounts of exercise because that can also cause almost like a stress on the body. You want to gradually increase your volume and intensity of exercise. But uh, do some moderate exercise every day is good. And I actually think the most important thing is just kind of keep moving. Like if you have to work in a desk job all day, which I myself do uh, most of the time, I try to do lots of little things. Like when I get a phone call, I stand up to talk on the phone. Uh, when I'm between cases, I will walk around a lot wherever I am to get some walking. When I go to the bathroom, I try to walk to the far bathroom. Uh, ideally, if you can, if there's a, if you have to, if you have an accessible bathroom that just takes, you know, some, a couple of flights of stairs, take the stairs. Just try to keep moving. Stand when you can. Um, that all just keeps the blood flowing and prevents it from uh, stasis. Okay, and be careful about long car rides, long flights. If you have to do that, the old joke was be well hydrated on the flight so you'll go void more often and you'll get up and do some walking. Okay. Those are the things that some things that cause blood clotting. Pretty well, no excessive stasis can do it, meaning lack of blood flow because you're sitting all the time. All right, number thirteen: avoid things that cause leaky gut and leaky gums because you got bacteria in your mouth and your gut, and the bacteria, if there's a leak in the gut or the gums, can release their endotoxins. You know, for gram-negative bacteria, it's LPS, lipopolysaccharide. For gram-positive bacteria, it's LTA, lipotychoic acid. And when those get into the blood, they will cause a distortion in the shape of the fibrinogen. It'll transform from being an alpha helix, cylindrical shape, to becoming flat like a deck of cards. That's called beta pleated sheet secondary protein structure. All right, and the relevance is the beta pleated sheets, because of the simpleness of their shape, can stack up on each other and stick together. And they can then precipitate out a solution, clot. Okay, um, so you want to prevent that. There's a whole bunch of other things that cause leaky gut. I made separate videos about that. I made a separate video about how to protect your teeth. Um, all the things that cause leaky gut and you just want to avoid them. I and mean, well, some of them are pretty obvious. You don't want any oil in your food. 
Don't take antibiotics unless you have to. Avoid things that are like antibiotics, like the GP on, on non-organic food, the F- in municipal tap water, the CL- in water. And you want CL- in the water until it gets to your house, but after that you want to remove it with a carbon filter at least because it's not good for you. Okay, and a lot of common medicines, NSAIDs, aspirin, they'll all do it, emulsifiers and processed food, carrageenan, and a whole bunch of other ones. I have a whole list of these on my videos on leaky gut. Okay, avoid F- toothpaste and mouthwash. I already talked about that because they, they remove the bacteria on the back of the tongue. Thus, you lose your ability to convert the nitrates from the greens into nitric oxide systemically. Oh, and then I, I didn't mention the Esselstyn eating greens through the day. Number 16, don't take any medicines that increase your risk of vasoconstriction or clotting. So what that means is there's a lot of medicines that do that. So before you agree to take a medicine, ask yourself or ask your doctor who may or may not know, and you better read about it yourself, don't be surprised if your doctor doesn't know what they're talking about. That's a common problem. Look it up, okay? And so I wouldn't take any medicine that increased the risk of vasoconstriction or clotting. I would not do it. Um, and a lot of medicines do it. So that's a very common thing that people end up on an iatrogenic cascade where they take one medicine to fix one problem and then it causes a new side effect and they take a medicine for that side effect and the new medicine causes a new side effect. Then they take a medicine for that side effect. And I think young people don't understand how many pills old people are taking. It's very common to see a patient on 20 pills. It's common. It's not like a rare thing. That's common. Um, you expect the patient, you know, if they're over 40, to be on at least three pills, over 50, at least five pills. Okay. It's like, like I said, you know, I'm 60 years old. Zero medical problems. Okay. Low-fat vegans are very commonly like that. No problems at all medically. All right. But if you look, if you just say 60-year-old patient to any any doctor in a Western world, that's like equivalent to saying 60-year-old person who's overweight, fat, pre-diabetic or diabetic, has hypertension, has coronary artery disease, has cerebrovascular disease, and probably has a degenerative joint disease in their hips or their knees, and um, probably has several other problems like, you know, early cataract, um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, impotence. You just expect all that stuff. You know, kidney stones, et cetera, et cetera, fatty liver. That's just, that's like, it's so common in Western countries that that's considered like like normal aging. I one time had a patient who, um, I read the brain MRI, and there were multiple periventricular flare hypertensives, which is just a fancy way of saying a whole bunch of small strokes. And, you know, that's a typical, and that, by the way, is typical. That's part of my macro for dictating a brain MRI. What I think was funny, though, is I look in the chart and I saw the internal medicine doctor's note. And he, the patient's uh, family had contacted the doctor and the doctor wrote, patients, and patient and patient's family reassured that, um, you know, this finding of multiple silent strokes in the brain is a normal finding for patients of this age. And I'm laughing because it is a normal finding. It's so common. When I see a patient over 55, I expect them to have at least one silent stroke, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I've seen plenty of brains where the patients are 80 years old, and there's none. There's not a single one. Zero silent strokes. But I would tell you, on average, most people over 55 have at least one silent stroke in the Western countries. And the older they get, the more they have. Okay, so you don't want that because a little bit, you know, it's sort of like a lot of times you can have a real small silent stroke and be totally fine and 100% recovered. But sooner or later, <clears throat> one of those could happen in a real important area and you could have a major deficit. Okay, and it reminds me a little bit of this guy named Paul Ehrlich. He was a population biology teacher. And he was a bit of a, a nervous Nelly, you know, um, you know, what's that old thing? Henny Penny, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the world's overpopulated, the world's overpopulated, we must do something to reduce population, oh my God. Okay, but he made a metaphor that he called the rivet popping metaphor. So what he basically said is, imagine you had an airplane, and every day you popped off one of the rivets. He said, the plane might fly well enough for quite a while, but sooner or later, there was going to be a big problem. And that's basically like what happens when you're constantly forming blood clots in your body and trash and tissue, okay? Um, you get a silent stroke in a, in a key location in the brainstem or something, and one little tiny stroke can have a big deficit effect. Um, whereas in the periventricular white matter, usually relatively mild effects from small silent strokes. But I'll see them add up. I can see in one patient, I can see hundreds in one patient. 
in some of these uh, patients with a lot of atherosclerotic disease. Okay, and hypertension is the main risk factor for all that stuff. Okay, number 17, excessive estrogenics. Excessive estrogenics are prothrombotic, and I think the most common one we think about is birth control pills. Okay. Um, and by itself, again, you know, most women who are on birth control pills don't have any significant clotting that we know of, but, you know, you don't want to increase your risks for no reason, okay? Um, how much does high uh, hormonal replacement therapy do have in older women? I don't know. I actually haven't read about that. That might be an interesting thing to read about. I'm sure it matters on the dose, uh, but, you know, I only got so much time and I have not read about that one. Okay, avoid things that cause insulin resistance. So, you know, classically, dietary fat's the main thing, but there's other things. High fructose corn syrup, circa inhibitors will do it as well. Because um, once you get diabetes, diabetes causes a microvasculopathy. The elevated chronic hyperglycemia, elevated blood glucose, is toxic to the endothelial cells, the arterial lining cells. And when those guys are damaged, the vessel becomes prothrombotic. And it'll often develop microvasculopathy, small little arteries and capillaries in high priority real estate locations. In the eye, diabetics go blind. In the toes, they get their toes amputated. In the heart, most common reason diabetics die is from coronary artery disease. In the kidney, lots of them are in kidney failure. Okay, number 19, avoid high fructose corn syrup in meat. Another reason why high fructose corn syrup is bad, it elevates uh, uric acid in the blood. Uric acid is a bridging molecule, meaning it sticks the red blood cells together. It overcomes the zeta potential. So it's prothrombotic, meaning it's predisposed to cause clotting. It also inhibits endothelial nitric oxide synthase, and that's how it causes insulin resistance. Uh, but that's also, of course, causing vasoconstriction and predisposing again towards hypertension. And hypertension is the main risk factor for atherosclerosis and stroke, so it's bad. Okay, um, and then a lot of people say, well, I'm taking a pill for my hypertension. Great, go ahead, maybe you need it, okay? But be careful, because a lot of times they're over-treating hypertension. I just read, I'm actually not done with the book, I was reading Overdiagnosed, a good book by Gilbert Welch, and he talks about how the thresholds to treat hypertension have been lowered so much. Back when he was a young doctor, they were about 160, okay? Then they lowered it to 140, and there's talk of lowering it even more, and what he's basically saying is, you know, some people are being over-treated for their hypertension, and that puts them at increased risk for side effects. And I've talked about how if you over-treat hypertension, you can make your brain not get enough blood flow. That's not good. That can cause a silent stroke. Uh, if the, pro the pressure is too high, you run the risk of intracranial bleed. But intracranial bleeds are rare. Okay, strokes are common. All right, so you sort of want the Goldilocks happy medium. You know, you want your systolic pressure, you know, keeping it below. I'm not going to get into all the numbers there, but... Uh, it's when it starts getting over 160 on a routine basis that you especially have increased risk of those high-pressure complications. All right, and so what, what Gilbert Welch was saying in his book was that, you know, severe hypertension definitely benefits from treatment, but, you know, the mild to moderate, it's not so clear. All right, uh, number 20, avoid meat for additional reasons. Increases risk of postprandial endotoxemia. It basically increases LPS and LTA, bacterial endotoxins, in the blood. Um, it also increases something called xenocyelitis. Xeno means foreign cyelitis, refers to the sialic acids that are sort of on the uh, glycoproteins of the glycocalyx, meaning the lining, the little uh, coating, sugar-coated lining of uh, your cells, like in particular your endothelial cells. And that can cause an autoimmune reaction whereby they're similar enough to get incorporated into our cells, the sialic acids from the meat and the dairy, but they're different enough that the immune system recognizes them as foreign and reacts towards them. Okay, you also get TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, uh, increased production in the liver related to meats, TMA. So you want to avoid that. It's just you, know, you just don't want to eat anything from an animal. Okay, and you know forget about all this, everything in moderation, like the typical stupid person says. You want to think biblically. Thou shalt not eat meat. Thou shalt not eat dairy. Because it's the people who think in that way who have the best chance of getting better. And same old story, like an alcoholic. You don't take a, tell an alcoholic you got to cut down on alcohol. You tell him you don't drink anymore. You don't get drunk on the weekends. Done. You're done with that. Okay? A smoker. You don't smoke anymore. You don't tell him cut down on it. You can have some on the weekends. No, you don't smoke anymore. Because the people who half-ass it, they usually don't get that good of a result. Okay, number 21. Have a strong sense of purpose. And religion can help with this. It's well known. Look at Harold Koenig's books. People who are religious are much healthier than non-religious people. 
okay? Um, it makes a person more resilient. Also, having a very strong sense of purpose will lower your stress level. And I can just tell you, like, when I went through my uh, residency, for example, my fellowships, you know, I had sort of a, a real scholarly life, and I was lonely a lot. You know, like when I was in college at Stanford, I didn't have a girlfriend once in four years. In high school, I always had wonderful girlfriends, okay? I briefly was back together with my old high school girlfriend. But what I'm trying to say is having a strong sense of purpose enables you to endure all the sadness, frustration, bullshit, insults, unfair treatment that we run into at different times during our lives, because I see a lot of people, and a lot of them, they're sort of devastated, and they're anxious, and they're stressed out, and they're a little wimpy. Um, and what I'm saying is, like, you know, why did I have such a strong personality? Because I knew what I wanted to do. I was pissed off. My wrestling career got messed up, so I was determined I was going to become, you know, one of the best doctors in the world, best scientists in the world. And basically, I wasn't going to let anything stop me. I was so mad at myself for screwing up my wrestling career that I would push myself to the limit till I would fall over from exhaustion. And the relevance of that was, and that got me in trouble lots of times. I had a lot of experiences in residency, even fellowship where people were pissed off at me. Uh, for example, when I was a resident, I didn't like going to the Rich Hospital where there were a lot of famous doctors because at the Rich Hospital, you weren't allowed to touch the patient. Whereas I traded all my time to go to the poor hospital and I could do procedures by myself, even with like no attending in the room. They would maybe sit there in the room next to me and, you know, if I had any questions. But I, I was doing unassisted cerebral arteriograms as a relatively junior resident, whereas, you know, no other resident in our program ever did an unassisted cerebral. Uh, they would always have fellows around taking the case or the attending doing the entire case by themselves. And uh, I did a lot of aggressive things in residency. I sort of was pissed off. I stayed in Chicago because it, I wanted to be near my mother who had cancer. I was doing what I could to help my mother. I thought she was going to be dying of cancer. She actually did surprisingly well during that time, but that's why I stayed local and I was pissed off. I belonged at Harvard as far as I was concerned. So I was real aggressive all through residency. I got a, I was done with the four and a half hour boards exam an hour and 10 minutes with a perfect score. And I tell you that, and I was by far the best resident doing procedures, but the program, they were so sort of pissed off at me for being so aggressive. Like the attending said, why are you such a hammer? Why are you so aggressive all the time? I'm like, well, I'm just trying to get good. I was not even a chief resident. That kind of pissed me off, but I thought it was a joke, okay? Um, their attitude was sort of just learn how to, you know, read these films, and you'll make a lot of money, and you'll have a good life. And it was like, why would anybody want to push to try to become great? It was weird. I hated it. I thought it was kind of lazy and mediocre. I felt like I was in kindergarten. Okay, uh, but anyways, I'm just telling you that, but the fact that I had this idea in my mind, I didn't care. Like when I was an intern... Uh, the attending told me to speak on, you know, pediatric uh, hiatal hernias, for example. And I said, no, I'm going to speak on the topic I want to speak on. Because most residents, you know, they're kind of shy and wimpy and they want guidance from the attending. My attitude was, look, I'm twice as smart as this attending. I'm going to do whatever's best for me. And uh, who, who does he think he is trying to tell me what I have to give my presentations on? He really had no right to do that. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is all of that type of behavior got me in plenty of trouble, got me bad grades on a rotation sometimes, but I knew I was developing my skills and that's what I cared about. I really didn't care too much. Um, I didn't, I was always polite, but I, I didn't really admire those attendings too much at all. I thought they were mediocre and they sucked, okay? So anyways, what I'm trying to say is if you have that strong sense, you know, it is my destiny to become a great doctor, then you really don't care when some mediocre scumbag tells you, you know, you're getting a bad grade for the rotation. Okay, I'm getting a bad grade because I didn't kiss his ass. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is you're going to run into that in life. Um, so you have to decide who you want to be, what you want to do. And if, and I like the Schopenhauer quote. He says, the best source of happiness comes from who a man is. A happy life is impossible. The highest a man can achieve is a heroic life. So I say, yeah, you know, everybody's got plenty of sadness, disappointments, frustrations, and loneliness in their life. But I say, at least I'm, you know, fulfilling my destiny to become a great doctor, okay? So that helps me to endure a lot of the sad BS things that I have to endure. Because you really have only a limited amount of time. You can't do all the things you want. You, you just can't. I wish one could. Uh, but it is what it is. So anyways, having that psychological sense helps. Also, religion can help in the sense that you say, well, you know, like I said, I, that theme song, I love that theme song, uh, I Will Serve the Lord by Kennedy Anderson. So look, while I'm alive on this planet, I'll do the best I can, and I'll sort of accept the good with the bad, but 
as long as you have that sense of purpose and that you're sort of like a source of the good in this world and the battle between good and evil and all that other stuff, you are then energized to get out of bed in the morning and go crank out whatever you need to do. And that helps, okay? Whereas a lot of people, I've seen them. I've seen kids who were, you know, top-notch, you know, A-plus students, and then their parents get divorced, they're psychologically devastated, and they become drug addicts and drop out of school. Um, okay, number 22, avoid excessive cold because uh, it's prothrombotic, okay? So I like to be warm, you know, and I kind of joke my families, most of them are meat eaters, a lot of them are fat, and they always want the thermostat like five to seven degrees colder than what I want. So I'm kind of outvoted, and I walk around at home wearing about, you know, sweatshirts and jackets, but it's okay. But that's how it ha that's what happens. Number 23, and then they tell me, oh, check your thyroid. You must be hypothyroid. I said, no, I'm not hypothyroid. You guys are just fat, okay? So I got my thyroid checked. All my thyroid functions were totally normal, and I knew they'd be normal because I got great energy, okay? So I knew it was BS. All right, number 23, avoid alcohol. Alcohol predisposes to fatty liver, insulin resistance, diabetes, and all that other crap. Um, and yeah, it's not protective. One or two drinks a day is not protective. That's all BS. We've talked about that before. Number 24, avoid toxins in general. Uh, processed food, fungal inhibitors, they tend to prevent mold growth. Um, these, you know, that's why they're there. The fungal inhibitors prevent mold growth, but they also tend to be mitochondrial inhibitors. And there's lots of other things that people think are healthy that I would never take, okay? Statins, they're, you know, mitochondrial inhibitors, okay? Uh, metformin's a mitochondrial inhibitor. SSRIs tend to be mitochondrial inhibitors. BPA, you know, the sort of hard plastics, mitochondrial inhibitor. Aluminum, mercury, glyphosate, cadmium. And there's a whole bunch of other ones. I got a list of over 50 of them in my lecture on mitochondrial inhibitors. So you avoid all this stuff just because overall health makes you more resilient. So when some problem comes along, like an infection or something else, your body's more able to handle it, okay? And you avoid things that, you know, cause insulin resistance, all right? So generalized good health makes the body more able to fix problems. Um, and I said it's like the concept of a video game, like Super Mario Brothers. You know, you're walking through an obstacle course in a video game, and you do the good things, and you get energy points. They make you stronger. You screw up and you lose energy points. They make you weaker. And that's basically like what health is. Do the things that make you healthier, avoid the things that are unhealthy, and you will be much healthier. Um, and basically, what does this mean? Imagine you have a brain cell and you want it to function 100% normal. If you get one of these amyloid clots and it blocks a capillary in the vicinity of that brain cell, it's gonna drop oxygen delivery to that brain cell a little bit. So the brain cell will still get some oxygen from other adjacent capillaries. Imagine the brain cell is being enclosed in capillaries around it in three-dimensional space, okay? So if you just occlude a couple of those little capillaries, the brain cell might get, let's say, 60% as much oxygen as it normally does. All right, well, if the mitochondria are functioning perfectly, um, you're probably going to be okay. On the other hand, if the mitochondria are already 50% inhibited because you're eating processed food full of these fungal inhibitors, you're taking a statin, you're taking an SSRI, you're uh, ingesting, you know, unfiltered water with aluminum in there, you're eating non-organic food with glyphosate and cadmium in there, and HG and high fructose corn syrup, well, then you're going to have inhibited mitochondria, and you might not be able to withstand that further drop in oxygen delivery to that brain cell, and that brain cell might go into apoptosis. And you know, you've heard me talk about this, the Peter Rogers MD theory of neurodegeneration. Basically, the cell has metabolic energy demands. It's metabolic rate. And if it cannot meet those demands <clears throat> for a prolonged amount of time, the cell just dies. It goes into apoptosis. Uh, so you don't want that to happen. And I think that's the most common reason people become demented. Because I look at tons of brains, and I usually don't see that much in the way of strokes. Uh, not enough to explain dementia. I usually just see primarily a shrunken atrophic brain. That's what apoptosis does. It shrinks the brain because neurons die and they are just reabsorbed by the immune system, the microglia. So anyways, this was 24 things you can do to decrease your risk of clotting and improve your health. And I think a lot of people are at increased risk for clotting, so this could be helpful to them. I hope this is helpful to you or someone you care about.